organized by organized by Chesky and uh, OBCP. Uh, this is Anna Ferro researcher from uh, Chesky. Uh, this webinar is part of a larger research project financed by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And the project is addressing the outcome of the EU conditionality on regional cooperation in terms of uh, EU integration and stabilization process of the Western Balkan countries. Many regional cooperation programs and mechanisms and initiatives were launched and designed over the past 20 years and different in scope, in resources and duration. But their achievements in terms of reinforced regional cooperation and gradual integration to the EU is today questionable. So this is the topic of today's discussion with our panelists. And uh, to inform you, a final research document will be published online across the summer, including an analysis of regional cooperation initiatives and the specific focus on the Berlin process. Um, today we'll try to squeeze in a one hour time with the flexibility. And at the end, there will be a QA and a um, session for the uh, very many um, registered attendees to this uh, webinar. So um, I give the floor to, uh, for the opening remarks to Andrea Cascone, that is a, a representative of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. And uh, please, Andrea, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, Anna, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm very happy to be uh, here with you for this very interesting uh, online webinar. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, CESPI and OBCT for uh, organizing this uh, discussion, which I find it very timely, as uh, indeed the regional cooperation uh, is uh, a feature that uh, is not uh, always uh, in the radar, but it should be because it's really the uh, backbone for uh, a region uh, like the Western Balkans. And uh, as you know, Italy has been uh, consistently uh, investing on uh, building up regional cooperation as a, a main avenue for stabilizing uh, the region and uh, supporting the, the uh, integration in the European Union of the Western Balkans. I um, just wanted to share a few thoughts, not really a speech, but a few thoughts uh, about uh, uh, regional cooperation, uh, uh, also based on my uh, personal experience in this year, dealing with all the frameworks and the discussions we were having in these um, frameworks. Um, I think today, uh, if we have to judge what is the uh, state of the art of the regional cooperation, of course, we would not perhaps have uh, an encouraging uh, uh, um, picture, just because I'm afraid that regional cooperation is undergoing through a lot of stress uh, with uh, several challenges that we have not yet uh, found a way uh, to properly address. Um, the first I, I point maybe I would like to make is uh, that COVID is still uh, making its effects felt in terms of uh, methodology of work. And this is also affecting uh, regional cooperation. Uh, we definitely see less mobility in terms of um, organizing and sharing the experience. Uh, the interaction, I would say, is much more real, uh, much more virtual than real. Um, I mean, in a way, it was it could have been expected because I mean, COVID was totally unprecedented. is has really shaken from the fundament. The um, the way the methodology we you, uh, we've been using, but perhaps what was um, not expected is this really um, uh, difficulty in going back to the usual standard. I mean, I still see today uh, we're struggling to uh, explain the added value of meeting in person, sitting around the same table, and sharing the experience, which is crucial for regional cooperation because it's. First of all, it's about sharing the experience, sharing the know-how, and, uh, and and building uh, a personal ties, which are very important. Uh, of course, when you look at the uh, regional dynamics, definitely um, the latest development in the Western Balkans have not been very helpful. Uh, the um, 
differences, the uh, difficulties we have, especially in certain dynamics, namely between Serbia and Kosovo, are affecting negatively the cooperation. They are poisoning the all the different tables where uh, we used to try to have a pragmatic approach. Uh, and uh, this is not the case uh, uh, since at least two years, three years. There are also other dynamics in the region which are not supporting. Lately, you have seen uh, uh, how the region had a difficulty in managing the discussions in New York about uh, the resolution on commemoration of Srebrenica. So there is, of course, uh, a, a trend to make everything happening in terms of political debates uh, affecting all the uh, frameworks, no matter what is the content of the framework. Um, there is also, I think, a, a more uh, um, conjunctural element that is not helping us on this. So the region is going through quite an extensive cycle of elections in the last uh, two years. Well, Serbia had elect repeated elections over the past two, uh, two years. Uh, um, we had election as usual in Bosnia Herzegovina in 2022, and we will have it again this year. Uh, in um, in Mon uh, Montenegro, we added in 2023, North Macedonia this year, so uh, Kosovo 2025, like Albania. So this is an element that unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, is not helping very much regional cooperation. First of all, because each of these countries tend to, main, to focus on the internal agenda more than uh, the um, inter um, cooperation. Uh, second, because in uh, several of these countries, relations with neighboring countries are part of the political debate during elections. And of course, I mean, this also um, is reflected somehow in terms of uh, um, willingness to move forward on certain topics, to be more uh, pragmatic and uh, to have a more proactive engagement. So um, when we look at what is happening in the different uh, um, frameworks, of course, this is all um, reflected there in a number of, I would say, either negative uh, steps or uh, I would say very much in terms of uh, stalled uh, discussions. Uh, we have the six agreements that were uh, signed in Berlin in 2022 for uh, mobility in the region under the framework of the Berlin process, which are not yet fully ratified. SEFTA agenda is not advancing. Uh, common regional market is uh, where we are still waiting for an assessment, but the impression that, that we are still lagging behind while Open Balkan Initiative is living in a sort of limbo. It's not very clear whether this is still on or has been off completely. And all of this is happening in a context where unfortunately um, the notion, I would say the culture of regional cooperation, working with the others is uh, yet uh, um, a bit weak. Uh, I am always surprised to see um, this is on a very personal note. I mean, the experience we're having, for example, by promoting the regional cooperation uh, uh, through programs from uh, uh, association NGOs. Um, we have a dedicated financial tool for this. And uh, whenever we have a public call for receiving projects, it's still very much limited the number of projects coming with this regional approach. I mean, we receive pretty much applications focusing on national level, very, very few about with the regional approach that um, engage more than one country. Now, uh, not to be too long, I just want to uh, maybe conclude with uh, three points, three uh, uh, things which I think it should be worthwhile focusing as a uh, work ahead. Uh, the first one, I think it, the most important one is the need to depoliticize the regional cooperation frameworks. Huh? This is uh, uh, related to what I, uh, I was mentioning at the very beginning. Bilateral or political issues should really be put aside in this framework. We should really rediscover the um, uh, pragmatic approach, which means less focus on formal issues, more focus on substantial issues. Uh, the second point is the need for, uh, I believe, the EU uh, to double the investment in the region in terms of uh, uh, capacity building and uh, supporting the region in uh, uh, finding a, a better way uh, to cooperate 
uh, and to strengthen regional ties, which is also very much about uh, uh, supporting know-how transfers, uh, uh, enabling these uh, countries to have the right human resources to develop projects with the, with the right approach. Um, and this is particularly urgent if we look at the um, demographic, uh, demographic decrease that unfortunately is affecting the region and is depriving the region from very precious resources in, for uh, the cooperation. Uh, last point I wanted to make it, maybe not a priority, but at least an element on which uh, uh, it, it is worthwhile, in my opinion, to think is that perhaps over the years, and Anna, you mentioned at the beginning, we have really created a lot of frameworks. Maybe we have multiplied the numbers, uh, not necessarily with a, a real added value in each of them. Uh, I think the commission back in 2018 made an interesting uh, uh, survey and they came up with uh, more than 60 among regional initiative organizations or fora, existing uh, in which are um, part the Western Balkans. And now for the region, which has uh, still a struggling with, uh, with you know, human capacity, human resources, I think it would be uh, uh, interesting to reflect on really uh, what are the priorities in terms of frameworks, which, which one have an added value, which of course is a very political uh, uh, issue and very sensitive one because everybody's happy to keep their own exercise alive and trying to go ahead. But I mean, uh, it's uh, it's clear that in the long term, uh, uh, somehow we need to address this. Somehow we need to uh, refocus and re um, our investment also as international community uh, and just uh, um, making the right investment on those frameworks who are able to deliver in terms of regional cooperation. So with that, I really look forward to hearing also your uh, uh, speakers' um, uh, comments and uh, of course to the Q&A uh, from uh, the participants. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador Andrea Cascone, head of the unit for the Adriatic and the Balkans, who rightly introduced uh, uh, some of the main uh, topics uh, that we will go through. So to start the discussion, um, Sabina De Silva, who's researcher at CESPI, will share with you some of the preliminary findings of an exercise of uh, mapping and analysis of different initiatives that were in fact taken into consideration in this abundance of uh, mechanism and programs that uh, took place over the 20 years. So please, Sabina, floor to you. Okay. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Andrea, for your interesting discussion. <laughs> okay, um, so I will offer an overview on regional cooperation in the Western Balkans, how it started and how it developed, and on the basis uh, of the data that we have collected during this month, uh, I will try to identify the main patterns in cooperation to better understand which is the direction that regional cooperation in the Western Balkans is taking. Um, first of all, as we can say, um, regional cooperation has experienced a period of expansion and contraction um, due to external elements, of course, uh, such as war and, and so on, but also due to um, political will of the elites in the, in the region. Um, first of all, it's important to notice that regional cooperation in the Western Balkans, at least at the beginning, was intended as a, a security issue, as a security instrument. Um, we are in the post-war period after the Yugoslav war, and there are a lot of initiatives uh, that are focused on stabilization and reconciliation security. Um, all those are uh, initiatives uh, uh, which are externally driven. It means they are promoted and guided by a uh, country outside the Western Balkans. Um, with the end of the conflict in Kosovo and the achievement of a period of, we can say, relative stability and peace, something starts to change. Um, we see uh, an increase in a local demand for cooperation in strategic areas uh, of common interest. And the turning point in this period is the Thessaloniki summit in 2003, 
um, because the Western Balkans for the first time receive a, a clear European perspective and regional cooperation became a precondition for European integration. And something in the nature of the initi initiative uh, began to change. Uh, we see the born of initiatives that are locally owned. It means that are uh, arose within the Western Balkans. Uh, the uh, the country in the region starts to spontaneously cooperate in order to achieve the criteria required by the European institution. Um, so uh, we can say that regional cooperation became a value, an instrument to pursue socioeconomic development and to address the security issues such as illegal migration and trust crime and so on. But uh, on the data that we have, we can observe two different trends um, in the cooperation today. Uh, first of all, as we say, uh, an increase in uh, uh, initiatives that are locally owned, and among them, uh, an increase in uh, bottom-up initiative. That means initiatives that are carried on by um, civil society and civil organization. Uh, the government are no longer the only one uh, allowed to promote cooperation, but citizens in the Western Balkans are entering the political scenario, uh, bringing in their political instances. And uh, that's because, of course, in part, uh, a consequence of the democratic process that is occurring in the Western Balkans. And um, this type of initiative, the bottom-up initiative, are mostly sectorial, are specific on uh, um, sector uh, such as public administration and education, uh, cultural exchange, student exchange, and so on. Uh, what we can say pros and cons of this type of activities. Um, for sure, on one end, uh, they are able to connect, to directly connect the people uh, from different country, thus creating a more proactive and vibrant society and community. Uh, they are detached from any political party, so they can guarantee a sort of continuity in the, in the project. Uh, also, if maybe uh, some change in the government balance can happen. But on the other hand, they often suffer from a lack of uh, um, structure, a lack of a specific budget. They often depend on the uh, donors and the member fees. So uh, what we can say, moreover, is the um, um, from our analysis, it has emerged that the initiative that performed better in the year are those who have a clear reference to the uh, EU accession process. Um, the one who are able to offer a strategic vision to cooperation that can create roadmap action plan, rather there be, as we said before, mere uh, fora for political uh, discussion. And European Union is now um, the most active external partner in cooperation and the main uh, uh, contributor, uh, financial contributor to cooperation. And we can say that the promise of a future membership and the subsequent conditionality um, has been, at least until now, the um, the main booster for uh, um, reform and uh, uh, stability, reform in terms of economy and democracy and so on. Um, we can also observe a change uh, in the thematic priorities of this type of initiative uh, from reconciliation to economic reconstruction, then re economic development and political coordination to hand with the newest topic, such as gender issues, climate change, and cybersecurity, which are the, the topic on the top of the uh, agenda of the European institutions. So, 
um what we can say i i want to uh, conclude with two problem and one consideration that are of course open for our speaker um the first problem we uh, were talking about bilateral disputes that are blocking the um, regional cooperation uh this is totally true but um the burden of bilateral issues is clearly shown by the situation of Kosovo, which is part only of half of all the initiative that we have analyzed. And for example, um, no initiative have a headquarter in Kosovo, in Pristina. Uh, this is quite significant. And um, the question is if it is possible that um, so uh, this kind of um, cooperation can can be a sort of a neutral space where bilateral disputes can be discussed and maybe overcome. We have some um, some example for the Western Balkan Six Chamber Investment Forum, uh, where uh, the the delegation from Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, Often can dialogue and uh, and have a prolific discussion. And uh, the uh, the second problem is that at the moment there is a sort of overlapping from uh, externally driven and locally owned initiative that maybe are focused on the same team, but there is a sort of dispersion of the efforts of the uh, economic political efforts. And uh, I want to conclude with a, a consideration. Um, what can be the, the elements that can, uh, can make possible for regional cooperation to, to help in reinforcing a sort of regional identity? We have some political issues nowadays that are on the top of the agenda of the political leaders of any parties uh climate change corruption illegal immigration and the consciousness that um common problem require collective action maybe can lead to a more and more integrated response so um <laughs> this was just a quick overview i hope uh that um i was able to to be clear enough so the, the floor is for our speaker now. But thanks a lot, Sabina. I'm leaving with open questions, I know. Thanks a lot. And I'm sure our panelists uh, will be able also to pick up some aspects. So um, next one is going to be uh, Nenad Djurjevic. He's advisor of the president of the Serbian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and head of the Regional Council for Strategic and Policy Initiative. He's a foreign policy expert and among uh, his key topics are political and economic developments in the Western Balkans and institutional relations uh, with EU and the USA. And he has an extensive record in working for governmental institutions. So for Nenad, some challenging questions. And first one would be to what extent can economic growth push the Western Balkan countries to greater cooperation? So please, Nedat, help us to understand better. <laughs> well, uh, hello to everyone. Buongiorno a tutti. Uh, good morning, uh, good day. Thanks for, for inviting me. Thanks for having me here with some of my uh, colleagues, also friends, uh, people that I know for a long, long, long time. Um, yes, uh, well, and thanks for the honesty, I think, of... Uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Cassone uh, and Ms. De, De Silva, uh, in their like uh, overview of the, of the situation, they are it's very punctual, very right. Uh, there is a lot of uh, issues that uh, are more, uh, there are more questions than answers. And uh, I'd say many, many things have been uh, uh, started, many things have been tested. I think many things have been said, uh, but somehow we are still, uh, let's say, going running the, in a kind of a vicious circle of uh, uh, ineptitude to, how to say, forge a common common denominator in the region of what is really something that uh, 
uh, will bring us uh, finally to the EU as a full fledged member, full fledged members that will enable our societies to prosper, that will stop the depopulation. And when you and then from the point of view of the business community, it will enable businesses to thrive freely. Uh, but when you mention all these challenges, uh, unfortunately, the answer is in a political realm. Uh, it's not an economic realm or business realm. Of course, there is there are all these you know unpreparedness of the parties, and we can say say about everything. But basically, the political realm is the is the one that dictates the the pace of reforms, the legislation, and it, uh, when the regional cooperation is concerned, it dictates the. How to say the, the way how do you perceive your neighbor the others and how to build bridges towards them and eventually if you are able to create some kind of a viable functional relations that uh, uh, at least can be at the level of coordination if not something uh, something deeper uh, the question uh, if the economic growth can can uh, help uh, uh, how to say the region to 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 go further to develop I mean, uh, in economic theory, I'm not an economist, but I think that I can know it. That really, it, I, I can know it well. Is that actually now that there is an assumption that you know, if there is a, a bigger growth, bigger economic development, bigger interconnection, then there is a, also uh, uh, how to say propensity for also bigger political uh, cooperation and a better better relationship. And that is, I think, something which also was somehow in the essence of this. Uh, New growth plan of the EU, where they finally understood that, uh, how to say, opening up the most important, one of the most important, but I think the most important thing that EU actually is, is the common regional, common market of the EU, to the businesses, companies, sectors of the Western Balkans is really demonstrating that you know um, there is there, there can be a feeling among the interlocutors in the Western Balkans. That they are really part of the of the EU in concrete terms in certain sectors and so on and so forth. So, uh, and I believe this is a good vehicle to uh, explain or to show that the cooperation is possible. It is necessary, and it is a good vehicle to demonstrate that you know only by uh, putting the the actors, the the Western Balkan countries or parties or whatever how they want to call them together, the synergy effect will be much much higher. Because if we see the co cooperation in the Western Balkans, uh, we are actually very much interconnected. Also from the period of uh, of, uh, of ex Yugoslavia, also now now with Albania, uh, our businesses are connected, our transport ties, our um, various economic uh, ties are connected, and this is you know how to say it's working, but it's not working at the extent that really can be. How to say uh, uh, satisfactory for everyone, because if you want to have a real uh, how to say uh, cooperation and uh, um, cooperation without uh, borders, without uh, boundaries, then you need the intensive cooperation of the of the governments in order to enable enable this, to remove the barriers, to work on harmonization on number of uh, of. Uh, uh, certificates, rules, and so on and so forth, and at the same time to harmonize two processes. We have to be just to be aware that each of us in the Balkans are going in the two processes. One process is the process that, of harmonization with the EU uh, to the SAA agreements and uh, imposition of all the keys necessary for uh, successfully completing the negotiation process. And there is a different level of uh, EU integration process among the Western Balkan countries. And on the second track, there is a regional cooperation where also uh, the EU re regulations need to be agreed among the six countries in order for them to be acceptable and, 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 agree, uh, and in agreement to, of, of, for all. And Mr. Cassone rightfully said, those institutions that were meant by they, and, and when they were founded in 2006, 2007, like SEFTA, to be that vehicle of transfer of, of transferring or, or, or I say harmonizing this EU legislation into the Western Balkans are completely stalled. And also since now we are in this paradoxical situation that actually, you know, uh, we are within our own uh, I, somehow framework created in a different period for different times. 
that now is actually uh, stalling the process of digital integration. And of course, that is not due to the to the system as such, but also is that that is also the case. But the, the regional dynamics and regional cooperation or regional not cooperation from 2007, 2006, 2007 to today changed a lot. Changed a lot. The EU changed a lot, but also, unfortunately, the Western Balkan political uh, river has changed a lot. And this is the reality. Thanks a lot. So I don't know if I answered the question about the growth. I can maybe do it later with the, with the new growth plan. But yes. For a, for a growth, I mean, you need a sustainability and predictability. And once you have that, then you, there is a good uh, basis for growth. But predictability and sustainability of policies, predictability of policies is something which is in the hands of the decision makers, both in the region, but also external actors like Brussels and other countries uh, out of the region. Thanks, Nenad. In fact, you raised also on the growth plans which maybe we can address uh, we give um, now the floor to Marta Spala who's senior fellow Central European Department and staff member of the Center for European Studies since uh, 2008 and lecturer at the University of Warsaw among other academic uh, collaborations She's a policy analyst and she cooperates with the Polish state uh, administrative bodies and different Western Balkan think tanks and international foundations. So to mark um, a question referring to which are the main benefits and obstacles to achieving regional economic cooperation in the Balkans in a comparative perspective from your point of view and your knowledge, if you can help us to get some elements on this. Uh, okay, so, so yeah, because I like I also work a lot on regional cooperation here in our region, it's like V4 or like TEFTA at the very beginning. And I think like also uh, uh, following what, what uh, Nenad said, you know, uh, the difference between, uh, okay, there are some similarities between Central Europe and uh, Yugoslavia, so and ex Yugoslavia countries on the Balkan, on the Balkan 6. Um, that uh, we were not so keen on uh, regional cooperation when the in the nineties, you know, we were cooperating. It was forced cooperation in the communist bloc, and after that, uh, we all aimed uh, on EU on integration with Western uh, Western organization EU mainly. So this there was no appetite uh, for the for the EU in, uh, for the for the regional cooperation and it was also somehow uh, first of all it was um, it was pushed by our Western partners so it was also like in Balkans this external um, actor who pushed for that. But secondly, uh, I think at, at the very beginning, uh, countries realized that uh, together they have uh, stronger influence uh, on the politics of the Western partners. And, uh, and also uh, that, you know, some kind of coordination uh, of cooperation is also needed uh, for successful EU integration, which was uh, our common goal. So there was a political will to cooperate, also, although the old politicians were quite hesitant. So, so also like, uh, uh, like continuing what Nedad said, without really will of political cooperation, it's really uh, of for a cooperation on political level, it's hard to think about the economic cooperation and politics influence. Of course, there were a lot of tension and a lot of conflict, also economic one between our countries, but this conflict would never politicize and never negatively influence the, uh, the cooperation. And this is this this is not the case in the case of, uh, of the Western Balkans. This is quite contrary or the tension are uh, immediately transferred to the, the political level and really negatively uh, influence the uh, mm, the cooperation. And the second thing is uh, what influenced our cooperation is the common goal, which is which was credible. 
uh, EU perspective, which is also lacking now in the case of the of the Western Balkans. And when you think about these two processes, which also Balkans and are uh, going through EU integration and regional cooperation, when you when we follow the regional cooperation in our region. We can trace it that uh, the countries really didn't want to uh, waste the time, energy, and capacity on regional cooperation when they have the goal of EU uh, membership. So, so with this really uh, small capacity in our countries, they when the when the uh, membership perspective was credible, they focus on that and. Uh, regional cooperation influence that, but on the other hand, and I think this is this is uh, benefit of this um, uh, of this cooperation. It's like exchange of our experience in the process of negotiation help us to overcome this lack of capacity. So there were intensive, although there was always competition between us, there was also cooperation. An exchange of information in the process of our negotiation and in smooth integration and uh, implementation of the EU key, but also um, enable us to be better prepared for the uh, 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 for the membership. Uh, and when we are speaking about the regional cooperation and the success and benefits, we really can see that it was speed up after our accession. So the economic integration happened when there were no borders and the, the regulation was harmonized. So this, that was that was the moment. And uh, so of course, like still borders on the Balkans, lack of Schengen membership, uh, it's something which really hampered the, the, the regional, regional cooperation. Because in our case, it has enabled us uh, to really use the opportunity given by the membership, mainly to create a value chains as a subtractor to German uh, German economy, which is the strongest one. And we can see that it is some somehow to, to some extent it is happening uh, in the Western Balkans, especially in Serbia and Macedonia. But what we are lacking is infrastructure. And you know, when you travel to Balkans by plane, you can see like, okay, countries are more or less connected, but when you travel by road uh, or rail, you can see that there is nothing. And that's why all the major investment are created along the uh, highway, uh, Serbia, Bul Bulgaria, Serbia, uh, uh, Serbia, Macedonia, and other countries are not that well connected or they are, sometimes they are, you know, like all of us has this kind of experience traveling from Zagreb to, to Tirana. And this is the huge, uh, huge obstacle, this lack of lack of, lack of infra infrastructure and you know the, the borders and the lack of credible perspective. Because I think like we can say that regional cooperation is not the sub substitute for the enlargement, uh, but actually somehow it is. And uh and yeah, and but only membership of the whole Western Balkan, all the old Western Balkan countries can really help to enhance uh, regional cooperation and uh, and make them the economies uh, more uh, or make the the business people to cooperate more uh, because we can see it. But as for now, as I think everybody mentioned, that lack of political will. And this idea to to work on bilateral uh, in, uh, in bilateral uh, manner with the EU institution and individual member states it's something which really hampered the the uh, the regional cooperation because the countries still prefer to compete with each other than to cooperate to push for common goal on common interest because they are common interests EU integration is the common interest. Uh, but since it's not that credible, like the competition mode and sometimes even like conflict mode, uh, mm, hamper the the cooperation mostly. Thanks, Marta, for also um, adding your perspective from your knowledge from the Visegrad countries. 
And we go back to NANAD. So, um, but mentioned in fact, the growth plan for the Western Balkans. So uh, we would like to know, what do you expect from this growth plan? Uh, what is um, its potential? And also, as Marta was mentioning, do you think the Western Balkan countries have the capacity uh, or the ability to efficiently manage the, the funds uh, or to negotiate also the, on the funds uh, and the context of this uh, growth plan? So please, Nenad. Well, uh, I think the new growth plan of the of the EU for the Western Balkans is long overdue, and uh, if we can call it unfortunately uh, due to the war in Ukraine and industrial intervention in Ukraine, uh, it actually ha ha have been uh, proposed and drafted to the to the Western Balkans because there was a there was some feeling that you know somehow something needs to be done also for the Western Balkans where many many countries are also negotiating the EU accession for the maybe not accelerated path to the EU, but definitely more uh, deeper uh, uh, agreements that, that enable deeper integ integration of those three countries in the EU, especially in the single market. And I think this plan is somehow an uh, answer to that, because our, uh, when I say our, I think about the Western Balkans, our uh, EU integration frameworks uh, to the SAA have been designed actually in a way that it has been conceived that this is a, just an interim step before uh, those countries will enter the EU. So uh, at that time, the European Commission did not go deeply into the um, into the really agreements with the with the countries of the Western Balkans, enabling them one of the things to enter the, the single market like they are doing now for Ukraine, Georgia, and and Moldova. So uh, we were blessed then, but that is our curse now. I mean, uh, in terms that you know we have to uh, now work with the, with the, with the, with the EU uh, to change the 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 SAAs in order for the countries of the Western Balkans to enjoy the benefit of the single market, for instance. So uh, this uh, this plan is uh, timely. I mean, timely as as much as <laughs> as it is, but I mean that is political reality. So therefore, it's timely. Um, it it enables, I'd say, joining the the single market in seven uh, in seven areas, but also it's basically these four pillars here to enhance economic integration in the single market, to boost and work on the. Uh, Western Balkan um, economic integration to the common regional market, like to creating a single market within the EU, within the Western Balkans. But also then it has the country to country pillar, which is to, to enhance the, the or accelerate fun, fundamental reforms and to provide the financial assistance uh, for, for those to, for those reforms. So there is a is a four four things. Uh, when we say, I mean uh, about the being able to join the, so there is a two conditionalities, I think, or maybe even three. One is that uh, each country or has to be able to fully sectorially align with the key community. So in order to, to uh, for it, for their companies to enjoy the access to the single market and to have the same status to the, as the, as uh, EU companies. Second is to actually work on creation of the common regional market. So to work on Action plan that is, has been designed by the by all six that already uh, was mentioned in the, at the beginning that is very much dissatisfactory the level of implementation of the previous version uh, and for uh, Kosovo and Serbia it has an additional condition to follow the uh, the normalization uh, path and has a third uh, criteria which is the reform agenda so each country should present its reform agenda. To the EU Commission, Commission should agree with it with a, with a, with a, each country, sign the contractual agreement, and based on this reform agenda, they are going to dis disperse the money. Uh, I am not so how to say worried about the capacity to absorb the money. I mean, if you see, that is not something really. I mean, it is a bigger portion, but it's not something which is like uh, that we can really I don't know spin our our heads can be spinned. I mean, if you just see. For instance, what is the package for Ukraine of 50 billion euros? 
and Ukraine is 40 million people. EU uh, and Western Balkans is 6 million billion foreign grants, uh, foreign uh, in loans, 2 billion in grants. If you divide it by country, it is a significant amount of money, but that's something which really can change the, the world. What I think is more important than the, 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 the money is actually this, how to say, uh, uh, a signal that by following certain paths, uh, our economy will be able to be fully aligned or be part of the EU. And that's something which is new thing. The second thing is, which I think is important, I'll see how that's going to develop, is much bigger, uh, much bigger activity, much bigger um, participation of the European Commission into the process. At least that is how we saw in past couple of months with uh, every couple of months, you have a high level uh, uh, meetings on the new growth plan, like implementation, the real world and so on and so forth. So I hope that that's going to be the case and that we will have finally with a reform agenda uh, and the first pillar, we will have some kind of a concrete action plan with deliverables, timetable, and then to know who fails if anyone fails. I mean, uh, so far we will just having the list of commitments and declarations with, uh, how to say, just general, uh, uh, notions who what should be done if that but methodology was implied was used like i don't know in 1985 when the beginning of the single market of the eu was conceived i mean the single market of the eu will never be created so at that time was really very concretely but also there's a different thing it seems that there is an external actor like the eu who is proposing something to the which is obvious uh, in terms of the benefit of the citizens, benefit of the businesses, to the local politicians, that they somehow then see how to how to react. Uh, for the Central European countries, I mean, and and what what uh, Marta was 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 speaking about, who were also part of CEFTA, there was a never a question of if they want to be part of the EU and if they are going to do everything necessary to be part of the EU. And the matter was, was, was the timing and how to do it. Uh, unfortunately, here we have ambiguous situation. We declaratively would like to be part of the EU, but then what, when, when we see what that really means for our internal political systems and uh, political arrangements, then some of our politicians are not so happy about that. And to add to that situation, we really had a very hesitant European Commission and European Union. And I mean, we also had to, I think we blunt with, about that. I mean, when we discuss and we negotiate with the EU, we do negotiate with the European Commission on the one hand, but we also negotiate for, not formally, but indirectly with the most important or, or biggest EU member states. And EU member states have their own vested interest in the Western Balkans and they're not necessarily the same as the proclaimed idea of you know uh, of, of EU Commission. So there is a, there is too much of the complexity. So I think that new growth plan is providing some framework. Uh, reform agendas will be hopefully made public uh, in June. But what I think is also missing, and this is a pillar of the common regional market, we have to address the deficiencies of the system that has been governed so far the implementation of the of this uh, common regional market. We need to see how that to change. We cannot rely on something with proven didn't function. And we know that CEFTA is blocked for three years, that uh, none of the agreements have been made so far in this respect. I, I said at the beginning, we have parallel processes of the EU integration and of the regional cooperation, which cannot be allowed. So by allowing, by, by, by opening up this process of how to say, uh, uh, allowing countries to be part of the EU single market, we need to also unpack and reform the process that guides the regional economic cooperation to strengthen the role of the government. Because the, finally, who is the most responsible for implementation or not implementation of anything are the government, not the regional cooperation council, not uh, coordinators, not civil society, not the chambers, unfortunately, but the governments. So we are all actors that can influence we influence as much as we can, somewhere, somewhere better, somewhere worse. 
but actually the governments are not co-responsible. And I think through the process of making them responsible, then we can we can know in six months or one year who is really delivering and who is not. And those that are not delivering, let's devise the way not to block the others. So I think that, yeah, this is uh, how, how at least uh, I see it. Thanks. Um, it's very clear. Governments have the mm, uh, responsibility and the leading role in this. So if, if we move on and look at the Western Balkan Regional Cooperation from the point of view of the civil society actors and stakeholders, uh, Marta, uh, how do you assess this and how do you think is the contribution from uh, uh, civic society uh, for improving or announcing Western Balkan regional cooperation? I think like the, the, the regional cooperation of civil society, society NGOs, and even business, even in the 90s were always good. So, so it's, uh, I think like also on the societal level, this cooperation is quite, uh, quite visible. NGOs are cooperating uh, quite effectively and, you know, they are, uh, they are providing common solution for, for, for common challenges. The, the, the solution could, could, can be a regional one, not, not, you know, focus on the, one uh, one single country uh, country and there are a lot of, of problems who can be resolved only by reg regional cooperation energy security it's like one one uh, like very specific uh, specific issue i also think that, that the civil society also contributed to to take better mutual in understanding because you know despite the old tension on the political level we can see that uh, th there is this kind of uh, this kind of uh, higher understanding on of different uh, uh, the other side, but but still, like we have the one main obstacles that uh, stakeholders don't want to cooperate with uh, with civil society, and this is the problem. And uh, it is a problem on, on the Balkan side. Uh, of course, like the government, uh, like some governments in the region are quite suspicious. Uh, 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 if they are, if they uh, are forced to cooperate with with civic, uh, civil sector, that they, they don't perceive the civil sector as the ally in achieving the common goal, which is regional cooperation and EU and EU accession. And I think this is this is the biggest biggest problem. But but what also worries me, especially lately, is that also EU is somehow neglecting the the, the civil society. And we can see it uh, when we are speaking about the parallel tracks. I think it, this is also the parallel track. So there is one track of EU policy towards the region, which is fo focused on the government. Of course, governments are implementing, and this is this this. Integration is intergovernment process somehow, and uh, there is this one that th this is parallel track of of uh, cooperation with the civil society, but they are not meeting each other, and three sides are not speaking to each other. Western Balkans government, EU uh, institution, and the uh, and the civil society, and and they are hardly meeting. And you can we can see like I was. Honor to participate in the uh, in the Berlin Process Summit in Trieste and then in other countries also in in Poznan in Poland, where the panels uh, in the panels when we have the representation of the government, civil society, EU institution, it's not the case anymore, you know, or it is rarely the case when you can see representative of the uh, the governments and uh, talking and quarreling or negotiation, exchanging the views with the. Um, uh, with the civil society, uh, civil society, uh, society sector, and uh, you know, last year in the Berlin, in, like in the Berlin process, uh, uh, during the Berlin process summit, the civil society got ten minutes to rep to present the uh, um, the recommendation, and they uh, so so you can see where where they are, you know, in the sense nobody even comment. 
uh, or re reactant on that. So, so th this is for me highly problematic. That, are, that especially the EU, uh, the EU institution, they they somehow um, know that this this cooperation is crucial. But but you know when when we are speaking about the practice. There is less and less uh, platform of this kind of, of cooperation. And this is also my personal experience when we try to establish uh, the, the this kind of cooperation of network of think tanks with administration. Um, they were very hesitant uh, to see think tanks which are also working in their favor. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, Marta, because you raised some of the very crucial points that will lead us also to um, another aspect. And just to say that in different research activities, uh, CESPI and OCBT together were focusing on civic society organizations in the Western Balkans with the role of watchdogs for democracy or for the acti communautaire. So at the national level, they are crucial, but for the regional cooperation level, maybe there are some uh, contradictory <laughs> elements uh, on that. And um, I'd like to hear from Gentiola, uh, that is a researcher at OCBT, uh, that is very knowledgeable on many of these aspects. Um, what do you expect uh, in consideration uh, of the October um, meeting, uh, this, this October um, 2024, there will be the Berlin Process Summit in Berlin? So what do you expect from this process also based on the whole introduction that Marta uh, made for us? Thank you, Anna. Yes, um, it is. it was already announced on the 10th anniversary of the Berlin process. In fact, when with Nana, with Marta, but also with Luisa and the other colleagues, we uh, we engaged or embarked in this process of monitoring and, and seeing how the Berlin process was uh, developing back in 2014. And exactly, we didn't expect it would last from the one side uh, ten, for 10 years. But um, at, at the end of the day, uh, the, the general conditions, uh, I mean, in the political level, at the international level, in terms of political terms, but also at the EU level, have changed so much in 10 years that now we question uh, the fact that should Berlin process uh, continue or not. It's a, a random question that has been posed several times by, by other colleagues as well. And initially, uh, my idea was... Um, was exactly uh, to be more uh, of a pro provocative uh, kind of. But now I see that there are some elements that Marta Nenad uh, already mentioned before. So I I'm happy uh, that we, we find some kind of agreement. In my uh, point of view, Berlin process has had this positive, has let's say explored this potential, has, ha has uh, incentivized some good initiatives, but on the, the other side, there is the, the, the second phase of the, the coin. When we speak about the, the economic connectivity and it's, let's consider it as a package, its inclusion within uh, the wider framework of the new growth plan, it is positive that from this small intergovernmental uh, initiative that was meant to last just for a mandate in general, uh, ended up with within a wider framework which has a perspective and we expect to have to, to gather to collect uh, positive results and the end uh, of the, 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 the term. Uh, meanwhile, when we, uh, as, as Marstam was mentioning, the human connectivity, um, there things are lacking. Uh, but uh, if before uh, analyzing or seeing the, the negative aspects, I would say that in uh, the most important issue in this moment or on the future of the Berlin process itself, and its continuation as we have seen it so far, or the perspective of uh, uh, having a, a new format or a, rev a revised format is the, the fact that the EU elections and the spillover effects that the, these results will uh, will have on the, the region are not to be um, forgotten or left aside. Every, everything, or let's say better uh, express myself, a lot of things might change uh, with, uh, with the outcome of the, the elections of this uh, weekend. 
and uh, the role of the new commission, the profile of the new commissioner, and also the priorities that this the EU, the new EU phase will will have from um, from this summer onwards will definitely uh, have an uh, an effect on uh, on the development of regional cooperation, but also on the speed of the reforms at the national level in the in the countries of the region. Moreover, uh, what I see important, and it's strictly linked also to Berlin process and to the objectives and the goal that was posed in, in 2000 and, and during the first meeting in 2014, is um, the credibility and the role of the member states. We have been talking about Serbia and Kosovo and the bilateral uh, disputes between the countries of the region, but we shouldn't undermine, uh, we shouldn't forget the undermining effect that the, um, the national political agendas of some member states are also undermining the credibility of the, um, the EU in the region. And here, the, the bilateral disputes exactly is the, 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 the issue. When I read a few days ago, as, as many others have done, uh, the news that Bulgaria might put pose the veto also on Serbia, as did in for North Macedonia on the right of the, the, minor, the Bulgarian minority, this is not a good news for the region. And the other, so we have Bulgaria facing issues with two uh, candidate countries. On the other side, we have Greece having issues with Albania and hopefully not with North Macedonia again. So uh, these are these are important uh, issues that Berlin Pros didn't manage to, but even EU itself is not managing to address with its own member stand. And imagine then the, the results of the pressure of these countries, uh, 27 countries on the region in order to resolve the problem that the region has bring forward, has brought forward for many years. So uh, it, it's not to be forgotten, uh, this aspect. On the other side, uh, I, I, I often question myself the issue of the reforms. We've grown up in, in the region listening about reforms, reforms and delivering. And yet in 2024, uh, unfortunately, these reforms are not delivering and who, who is doing the reforms and why is not implemented. Who loses loses the most from uh, from the reforms? Are the citizens or are the governors? On the one side, generally, we say that we unfortunately the Balkans have uh, this um, this unsuccess of having the same leaders for many years, which imply that having a leader for three mandates or more, Albania, Serbia are some example. Montenegro was before. It would have pro provided to the government the, the the continuation to implement the reform, which unfortunately hasn't and has not resulted like this. And having the same leaders promising for many years, promising the same things to the citizens, but also to the EU, and seeing no uh, no changing in this continual trend, um, brings to uh, stagnation. Unfortunately, not to progress. And uh, it, it is well known that it's not the fault of EU and its member states that we, we have the leaders we've chosen, but uh, sometimes it's also needed to blame uh, openly when things are not working and who is responsible for. And uh, therefore, uh, we need also to go beyond, as, as uh, Ambassador Kaskana mentioned before, the politicization of key priorities, which are linked also to the life of the citizens beyond the four years mandate on beyond the, the political career we were on to leaders. Going back to human connectivity, as, as Marta said, civil society is well um, well connected, have always brought but built bridges among the countries, has managed to uh, surpass some barriers in order to survive and to realize uh, to put into practice the mission. Uh, and uh, for me, important is to mention also the role of media. But then, in the under the Berlin process, this possible this opportunity is, in my point of view, is not has not been achieved. 
uh, what has been achieved so far is a merit and, and it is to, to be recognized the civil society actors involved in the process, but on the other side, who uh, chairs the, the Berlin process has not, uh, every year has not taken into consideration enough adequately that the civil society. We, uh, I will take just two examples in order to be short. In the case of Poznan summit, where uh, I remember that I met with Marta and also Nenad, we had the, the, this Poznan declaration, uh, in which was so long. It is the longest one with respect to the other annual declarations. We have also until included also the um, municipality's role in the European integration. So the urban dimension, which goes beyond any perspective uh, in, in general of the Berlin process. So you have an expansion. The media uh, and the role of media and the freedom of media was there as well. And then we switched we switch to Tirana, which is the last one uh, that, that we attended. And then we see that media or any reference to civil society forum and its uh, uh, recommendation at the end of the day are not mentioned at all in the final declaration. And here, I wouldn't blame uh, the, the, the actors, the non-governmental actors. I would blame who uh, chairs the, the drafting of the the conclusions for not including this aspect because we are turning back to the past, unfortunately. Therefore, um, to conclude, I think that Berlin process has, as has said in the first phrase, in the first phrase, has already released its potential. And now, with the conclusion in December, in my point of view, it should be incarnated what has been achieved so far and pass the turn under the EU framework in order to bring proceed forward and to have onto the table of discussions the member states from the Western Balkans and all the member states from the, um, the EU in order to discuss this important agenda and, and issues that are, are have been raised so far. Thanks, uh, Dintiola. And there is a, a question from Silvia Oggiano. I'm reading this and maybe um for the audience also for the panelists also who want to answer as uh, starting maybe from sabina uh why the security concerns posed uh, by the war in kosovo did not create enough political will among the eu member states to enlarge toward the region and do you think the war in ukraine could speed up the enlargement process toward the western balkans uh, Mm, so maybe we can have a quick round also, if you also want to add comments. And Sabina, if you want to okay. start. Or... And I, I, I can start if you want, okay. Yes, um, the answer is not so simple. It's not only about political will, you know. Um, on one hand, we can say that the Ukrainian situation had in somehow speed up the the process in 2022 the european union opened the access negotiation for albania and macedonia uh, during this year with bosnia so um uh what the war in ukraine have done is to uh to revive the discussion about how it it is possible to manage a uh, european union that can open its door to six more members, seven, nine members, if we count also uh, Moldova and Georgia, for example. Uh, and this posed question uh, about how the European Union can, fun can function, uh, also question about the, the veto power, as Gentiola was said before uh, to 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 open the the door to other candidates um, without reflecting on uh, another type of uh, functioning in the European Union, this to to block and to paralyze the the institution, for uh, for example. So uh, it's not only about political will. Uh, Mm, most of the of the discussion is about the level of preparedness of the candidate countries. Um, for example, uh, on uh, on the team of civil rights, LGBTQ community, um, women empowerment, and so on. So the 
the the discussion is a bit more complex uh, uh, of this and uh, uh, but we as Chespi and OBCT also have analyzed very deeply the, the situation in our policy brief and paper. So maybe I can publicize our work. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sabina. I think we can um, give the floor to Luisa, who can also help us to um, comment on this uh, um, complex question and also uh, share with us her thoughts. I think the, um, the, the, uh, we have two completely different contexts. If we think about the Kosovo-Serbian um, uh, issue and today's um, war in Ukraine, not only because something happened 20 years ago and we are in a completely different geopolitical scenario, but uh, first of all, because the European integration process was proposed to the Western Balkans in the uh, tradition of um, the European Union, which is uniting to solve conflict. So as a peace process for the Western Balkans to, while for Ukraine, it has become a security issue. We have an external menace coming from Russia. Um, and as it is often the case, the external menace uh, favors uni um, unity among those that are menaced. Um, unless they are able to do the Vidya Timpera. But generally speaking, we could say that today we have an external threat that pushes for an answer, um, while finding a, a, a solution internally in the region, as we have seen in this last very many decades, um, is a more complex issue. And uh, because the integration process didn't go as fast as um, it was supposed to, uh, the conflict remained unsolved and the other way around because the conflict was so difficult to solve the integration process lagged behind so it's um most of, most of it uh, lies into this geopolitical context i would say luisa do you want to keep wrapping up as we are um, ahead of time there are no more questions for the speakers Nope. Okay, so a few words then to to conclude this interesting discussion. Uh, we've heard a lot of uh, important comments. Um, let's remember we're talking about a very small region. Um, if again compare, uh, is even ha less than half of Ukraine itself, but fragmented in small markets uh, with uh, underdeveloped infrastructures, a shortage of labor force. Uh, and um, by the way, also relatively high cost of the labor force. So generally speaking, with um, a difficult, um, not only geopolitical scenario, but also economic um, perspective. Um, we started our work uh, of this research with the observation that in the last two decades, uh, the number of regional cooperation initiatives increased significantly, right exactly when the enlargement process was slowing down. So um, somehow um, the question was why and what did this reveal? And as Gentiola stressed, where should it, it go uh, if we think about uh, the Berlin process as one of the most important regional cooperation? Uh, basically, somehow um, this the observation confirmed the fact that um, the fear of the Western Balkans that any regional initiative was as an alternative, was proposed as an alternative to um, the EU integration process rather than being um, a possibility to enhance the integration process. It's a, a suspect, that fear that uh, regularly returned um, into the debates, um, not really immediately, but over time while the, the enlargement process was slowing down. Then recently we saw this multiplication of initiatives uh, that were also um, uh, originating from local leaders themselves. Uh, somehow we observed that very often they could also be simply electoral move, like political restyling initiative rather than uh, real commitments. Um, somehow it has been said um, that uh, there are difficult and issues in, in it was minded uh, how important the uh, um, bilateral 
issues brought up by member states um, had uh, and still have a role to play. And uh, we should be very wary of the risk that they will be even more so with the, with the new um, uh, commission that will be um, the, the result of the uh, European elections of uh, this week. Um, the long plan was uh, the, sorry. The, the growth plan was long overdue, as stressed by Nena. Indeed, uh, it is an important um, opportunity. Although um, the expectation is that of the cumulative effect uh, on the side of the European Commission, the idea is that uh, um, with more resources, we will stimulate. Um, um, uh, countries to carry out the, the, the structural reforms that they've been promising for, for many years. The hope is there, um, as well as there is the fear that um, uh, the, the resources are not enough, and we will have to see uh, to what extent these resources really do create the sufficient incentive for um, political elite that uh, we were stressed, have been there for a long time, and um, are part of the problem rather than the solution. Indeed, anyway, it is an opportunity um, as much as a challenge. Um, and necessarily, um, this, uh, uh, as Andrea um, uh, Cascone uh, um, referred to, there are also needs to depoliticize these uh, discussions, also to look at very concrete results that, uh, that, are, that can be achieved and have not been achieved. Sometimes we simply discuss about certificates, um, the, the fact that um, firms in the regions have to have produced number of um, certificates in order to cross borders with their um, um, goods when they want to export to um, markets. So the amount of licenses or cuts that are could be um, eliminated to avoid um, burdens on the uh, on the level of local um, um, firms. This is part of um, the responsibility of governments that was uh, um, clearly uh, stressed um, by Djurjevic as a fundamental uh, actor that uh, has to take the responsibility. And it is very important to uh, uh, hope that um, the new growth plan with its conditionality shows who is responsible and when. Uh, however, um, it is also very important to have stakeholders um, uh, ready to um, highlight this responsibility in the public sphere. Uh, we know that media are not particularly free. I would say media are very heavily controlled and um, they are part of the problem rather than the solution in the region. But stakeholders can also give a, a push in terms of highlighting what should be done in concrete terms. Um, it is democrat the democratic decay, or if you want, the limited capacity of stakeholders to make a difference uh, um, in the local democratic uh, decision-making process that is um, an issue that uh, cannot somehow highlight clearly where things in a concrete terms should be done and who is responsible for this uh, lack of results. Um, Mm, of course, the perspective of the EU integration process that was so important from, for Central Europe, um, as stressed uh, by Marta uh, Spala, um, that it, this should not fade. Uh, so uh, it, unless we do have uh, the main incentive there, uh, the regional cooperation, we've understood it very clearly from the seminar, and we know it by now after so many years, is uh, um, a central aspect to take into consideration. So I thank you very much uh, for your contribution. We will be able to uh, put um, and share um, the overall uh, research uh, we did um, with many evidence uh, of the different aspects and uh, um, of the variety of uh, experiences that were that took place in the last uh, 20 or more years. Uh, during the summer, and we hope you'll be interested in um, in looking at it uh, once it is published. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luisa. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks for the um, presence of the public. As Luisa mentioned, there will be a final document published online on both websites from OCBT and Chespi. Uh, you will be able also to reach it uh, through the different newsletters from Chespi and OBCT. Um, we thank you very much for your time and uh, all your contributions and have a good summer to you all. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.